most of my life, I have really enjoyed swimming. My family used to come down to Florida when we lived up in, in New York every year, and we'd spend a month down here, down in Venice. And we'd go swimming. I loved to swim, you know, especially when it wasn't too hot outside. Anybody here like to swim? All right. Anybody here ever dip your toe in the water when it was very cold, so cold, in fact, that you began to question your life choices? Anybody ever been there? You ever decide once you put your toe in that water that you weren't going swimming, that you weren't going to get in the water? That That's what I'm talking about today. Our predilection. I love that word, predilection. How often do you get to use predilection in a sentence? I'm going to predilect today. I'm a predilector. Hey, let's go predilecting. I love that word predilection. Our predilection to do nothing when the water's too cold. Even when we're in a boat that's fixing to go over a waterfall because the water's too cold. So last week we began our celebration series and we were celebrating hope. Do you all remember that? I referred to hope as one of those powers of Christ in our lives that, that, and I said that the power of hope in Christ cannot be overstated. It is the power to change us into better versions of ourselves. Does that ring any bells? Please tell me it does. The power to change us into better versions of ourselves is going to be an ongoing, reoccurring theme of this celebration series. I mean, at the end of the day, let's be honest, isn't that something we all want to do? Don't we want to... To, uh, to become better versions of ourselves. Anybody here doesn't want to become a better version of themselves? I see you in back. I'll talk to you later. I'm kidding. There were no hands going up. This week, I want to continue our Celebrate series by celebrating a commitment to action. That's kind of why you saw that mini-message in the very beginning. A, a call to action, a commitment to action. Action, especially Christ-centered action, like hope, has the power to change us into what? Into a better version of ourselves. What we're really talking about, though, is action versus inaction. Do you ever have a problem choosing what to order off a menu? Um, what color to get? I don't know. What, what uh, toothpaste to buy? Here's a better one. Did you ever make a choice and then later on say to yourself, what in the world was I thinking? Sometimes they call that buyer's remorse. I sure have gotten a prime rib as opposed to the liver. Boy, that's an easy one. <laughs> Why in the world did I buy a black car in sunny Florida? I can fry an egg on the hood. I should have gotten Colgate as opposed to Crest. We have to choose. I really need the toothpaste. But our call to action is hampered by our desire to do nothing and or change our minds. Commit to committing. My point is our lives are filled with calls to action, times and places where we're called to commit to one thing or another, and then we're called to commit to those commitments. It's not enough to put the toothpaste in my shopping cart. i got to pay for it too or they're going to arrest me. Sadly for some of us, the cashier line is filled with a chance to change our mind. How often do we see random items placed on the shelves near the cashiers, placed there by people that changed their mind because they didn't want whatever it was they stuck in their cart? We call that back and forth commitment to action equivocation. Another one of those wonderful words that you rarely get to use in a sentence. Equivocation has never been a path to success. There's a scene out of Shakespeare a play Macbeth, specifically Act 2, Scene 3, that speaks to this. I love it. It's a short scene, but it's one of the most memorable, at least for me, in the entire play. A doorman, a, a porter, has been tipping the bottle a little bit, and he's lamenting the lack of, of moral fortitude in society. Everybody seems to be out for themselves. And he imagines himself the doorman to the gates of hell, greeting newcomers as they enter hell. So let me share with you a very little bit of Macbeth, Act 2, Scene 3. I'm, I'm the tipsy porter. I know that's going to be hard for you to imagine, but just pretend like I'm the tipsy porter. There's a knocking indeed. If a man 
were deported to the gates of hell. Oh, he died of old age, turning that key. Knock, 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 who's there? In the name of Beelzebub, the devil indeed. Oh, here's a farmer that hanged himself in expectation of plenty. Come in, come in, but bling a plenty of handkerchiefs. It's uh, very hot, you'll be sweating here. Knock, 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 who's there? In the name of the other devil. Faith, there's an equivocator. Who committed treason enough for God's sake? I, you can equivocate into hell, but you can never equivocate into heaven. Come in, equivocator, come in. Knock, knock, knock. Who's there? Faith. An English tailor's come hither for skimping a little too much on the fabric. Come in, tailor, come in. Then you roast your goose here. Knock, knock, knock. Never quiet. What are you? This place is, is too cold for hell. I'll be the devil's porter no longer. I had thought to let in all the professions that go the primrose path to the everlasting bonfire. Anon, anon, I pray you, remember the porter. What I love about that scene is the line, you can equivocate into hell, but you can never equivocate into heaven. Equivocation, indecision, a lack of commitment, these are all signs of inaction. The reverse, the antithesis, I love that word too, the antithesis of action. Remember what I said, action, especially Christ-centered action, has the power to change us into a better version of ourselves. I'm going to speak to committing to action, Christ-centered action, in terms of three things. And you can think of these three things as a challenge if that helps you. First, commit to action. Simple, commit to action. Second, commit to action fully, without reservation or equivocation. Third, commit to action both on the mountains and in the valleys. There's a passage out of Revelations that I want to focus on today. The Apostle John, by the way, wrote Revelations, but he wrote it, he was recounting a series of visions or dreams that he had received from, from Christ via the Holy Spirit. And so much of what we see in Revelations, therefore, is told from the point of view of the Holy Spirit and the risen Christ. So the section I want to focus on is Revelations 3.14 and a little bit beyond. John has written at the behest of the Holy Spirit letters to seven churches. And this is the seventh letter, a letter written to the church of Laodicea. And it begins like this. The Amen, the faithful and the true witness, the beginning of the creation of God, says these things. And this, by the way, all of this is, is John's way of saying Christ. Christ said these things. The Amen, the faithful, the true witness, the beginning of the creation of God, Christ, says these things. I know your works, that you are neither cold nor hot. I wish you were cold or hot, so then you are lukewarm and neither cold nor hot. I will spit out my mouth to you. For you say, I am rich and I have stored up goods and I have need of nothing. And yet you do not realize that you are wretched, miserable, poor, blind and naked. I counsel you to buy from me gold refined by the fire that you may be rich and white garments that you may be clothed that the shame of your nakedness may not appear. And I anoint your eyes with, with salve that you may see. Those who I love, I rebuke and discipline. Therefore, be zealous and repent. Listen, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in and dine with them and he with me. To him who overcomes, will I grant to sit with me on my throne as I also have overcome and sat down with my father on his throne. He who has an ear, let him hear. Hear what the Spirit says to the churches. Wow. Wow. Remember my first challenge? Commit to action. John's letter to, from Christ to the church of Laodicea is to note that they are lukewarm Christians. 
neither hot nor cold. According to John, Christ would prefer them to be either hot or cold, wrong or right, good or bad, something, something. According to John, Christ would prefer them to be neither hot nor cold, that being in the middle was the worst place to be. Why? Because when you're in the middle, when you're trapped in equivocation, when you're trapped in a state of of inaction, you often don't realize that you're wretched and miserable and poor and blind and naked. When you're a lukewarm Christian, you very well may hear Christ knocking at the door, and yet due to indecision, you refuse to open the door and thereby miss the greatest gift God has ever given somebody. Action, especially Christ-centered action, has the power to change us into a better version of ourselves. Guess what inaction has the power to do? Not a bloody thing. Not a bloody thing. My first challenge to you is this. Commit to action. Open the door. My second challenge to you is this. Commit to action fully, without reservation or equivocation. You can equivocate into hell, but you can never equivocate into heaven. Committing to action fully without reservation or equivocation has profound implications for us as individuals and for us as a church. We try to explain. This is a wonderful church. And and don't, don't misunderstand me and don't get me wrong. Don't misunderstand what I'm about to say. This is a wonderful church. But this is a dying church. Spoiler alert. Every church, every church, every church is a dying church. Northwest doesn't get any bonus points for being unique here. Every church is a dying church. It's just some churches are dying faster than others. Every church is one generation away from death. This is true for this church and every church that ever existed, every church that exists today, and every church that ever will exist. It's an inescapable, immutable, inevitable, fundamental result of our earthly mortality. It cannot be argued with. It is a fact. Period. End of story. Every church is one generation from death. So what does this mean for us? If we want the church to survive, we must commit to recruiting, to reaching, to ministering to, the next generation, period, end of discussion. Perhaps not. My second challenge to you was to commit to action fully without reservation or equivocation. The church can commit, but not commit fully. What happens when a church fully commits to the next generation without reservation or equivocation? The answer may surprise you. What happens when a church fully commits to the next generation without reservation or equivocation? Nothing. Nothing. I told you it was going to surprise you. Nothing. We can build a gym and even, you know, a school for the kids. We can have carnivals in the back lot. Where's the back lot? We have carnivals in the back lot. We can have the best and most modern sanctuary and the church, the best, most modern church in the city. We can yank out these pews and put in round tables. It doesn't matter. They all may be important, even critical to our success, but ultimately, they mean nothing. Churches, in this case facilities, church facilities, and church events cannot commit to anything. It's the people that make up the church that have to commit to taking action. Do you see the difference? Everybody follow what I'm saying? This is important for our future. If you, if you don't understand me, raise your hand. It's okay, don't be shy. I'll stop what I'm doing and we'll talk about it. Everybody understand that I'm talking about the people, right? Action has the power, especially Christ-centered action, has the power to change us as individuals and almost more importantly, as a church, into a better version of ourselves. 
Listen to what John wrote in Revelation 3 one more time and catch the brilliance of what Christ is saying through John. To him who overcomes, I will grant to sit with me on my throne as I also overcame and sat down with my father on his throne. Did you see it? Did you catch it? The letter is being written to the church at Laodicea. But John doesn't write to the church who overcomes. He writes to him who overcomes. The moment the people of this church or any church decide to commit themselves fully without reservation, without equivocation to reaching the next generation is the moment we will become better versions of ourselves as individuals and as a church. Now, I want to make a point here. Fully committing means not asking what the church can do for me, but what I can do for the church. Kind of sounds a little bit like JFK, but fully committing to reaching the next generation means everything we do. Everything is geared towards the next generation. Not some things, not many things. Fully means fully. Mark 10, Jesus says, let the children come to me. Do not hinder them. In other words, don't get in their way. Don't, don't put sacred cows so they can't get there. Don't make the sanctuary something that they're afraid of. Don't hinder them. I got sent a, uh, an email yesterday from members of this church. I won't mention Jim and Paulette's name. <laughs> Talking about a number of things having to do with the sanctuary. And the one that really caught my attention was a Boy Scout troop came in. And they were doing whatever they were doing. And a young kid comes up to the pulpit. And he bangs it three times. He says, the court will come to order. And everybody laughed, except for the pastor. The pastor recognized something. He said, this is how the young people view the church, as a place of judgment. How sad is that? Do not hinder them, for the children, to the children, belongs the kingdom of God. Truly I say to you, this is Jesus speaking, truly I say to you, whoever does not receive the kingdom of God like a child shall not enter it. Let me ask you a question. Aside from the political stuff going on right now, how successful is Disney World? Why are they successful? Everything they do is geared first and foremost to the kids. Disney is fully committed to reaching kids. And because they're kids, their parents come too. Churches tend to try to reach the parents in the hope that their kids will come, rather than reaching the kids in the hopes that they'll bring their parents. This despite the fact that Christ himself tells us to focus on the kids and to approach church like kids. What's wrong with us? Where did we, where did we lose the connect here? Am I wrong? At what point do we fully commit? At what point do we build the gym? At what point do we build the school? At what point do we fill the church with dogs that want biscuits? At what point? Fine. You're doing this every Sunday. Chuck, don't you feed this dog? <laughs> at what point do we fill the church with stuff that appeals to the kids at what point do we as adults begin to act in a way that truly motivates them to join us like feeding the dog in the middle of a sermon pause with me a moment and Jim I apologize I, I apologize no I don't no I don't no I don't that's an equivalent? Good. Somebody's listening. She only heard me practice it about 20 times at home. But somebody's listening. Pause with me for a moment and put a picture in your mind. Jim's up here doing the announcements in a Donald Duck costume. You got you signed up for that? Okay. At what point do we decide we want this church to survive and become willing to dress Jim up in a Donald Duck costume using a 
biblical next generation model. Do you ever ask yourself, by the way, why Jesus shared that first communion at a Passover? He broke a loaf of bread and, and lifted a glass of wine. Keep in mind, Jesus and the boys, the 12 disciples, they walked some 10,000 miles over the course of the three-year Jesus' ministry. If you subtract out the Sabbaths and, and do the math, which I have done, that works out to roughly 10 miles of walking a day. It's closer to 10 and a half, but who's quibbling? Folks, if I walk 10 plus miles a day, I'd be hungry. Do you think the 12 disciples took breaks each day and each of them headed out to grab a bite to eat on their own? Peter, John, and Andrew, they went to Jerusalem, Joe's from their famous garlic matzah. And Matthew and Mark, they went to Manna by Martha, who specialized in desert cuisine. And Thaddeus, James, and the other James and Philip, they did the open market food court thing. And, and Judas, nobody cares about Judas anyway. My point is, of course not. These 12 disciples ate with Jesus all the time. He could have done this whole communion thing anytime he wanted. Why did he do it during a Passover? Because a Passover was a Jewish Seder, and Seders were festive events, not at all unlike you know, Christmas Eve for us. Festive events, celebrations, if you will, designed first and foremost for the kids. It had games and fun foods and stories and, and prizes and dancing and singing. And, and the Bible is very specific in, in instructing that each generation is to share their faith with the next generation. That's not me making it up. That's in the Bible. Passovers were a huge part of making this happen. Passovers first and most important priority was to reach and teach the kids. This is where Jesus chooses to share that first communion with the next generation. We lose that somehow. I can't tell you the number of churches that will not allow kids to be involved in communion, either taking it or serving it. Where'd we go wrong? It's in the Bible. I'm not making this stuff up. This all begs the question, is our first priority us? Or is our first priority the next generation? Committing to Christ-centered action, committing fully, without reservation or equivocation, are the first steps towards becoming a better version of ourselves as individuals and as a body of faith, as a church. A church that is more than just a facility and programs. Those things are important, but they're not critical. The third and final challenge I laid out was this. Commit to action both in the mountains and in the valleys. Let's be honest. It's, it's easy to be generous with your time and your talent and your treasure when times are good, when you're living on the mountain. It's easy to love our spouses when our marriages are doing well, when we're living on the mountain. It's easy to thank God we're in the midst of prosperity when we're living on the mountain. The problem is we all of us spend some time in the valley. It's part of the human condition. It just is. When money is tight, it's harder to give. When our marriages are going through rough times, it's harder to remember we love our spouse. When we're in a rough place, it's harder to remember to love anyone. When our hurts and our hang-ups and our habits get the best of us, it's harder to remember to thank God for the blessings in our lives. You know, many marriage includes a few lines in their vows, in good times and in bad, in sickness and in health. This is the very same thing I'm talking about. This is the same call to commit to action, both on the mountains and in the valleys. If you take nothing else home with you today, and put it in your back pocket from today's message, let it be this. Christ-centered action has the power to change us into better versions of ourselves as a church and as individuals. May we be a people of action. Let's welcome the next generation so we can continue the good work of this church. All those ministries that we're engaged in, ask yourself this, how much better would they be if they were teaching vehicles for kids? If the kids were building and distributing the bicycles, if the kids were involved in, in sorting food for the food pantry and, and passing it out, how much better would they be if there were kids involved in every good work we do? 
I'm excited just thinking about it. Let's pray. Lord, may the hope that is Christ abide in us. May we celebrate that hope by how we live the gospel. May that gospel-inspired hope be manifest, not just on Sunday morning, in the here and now, but in every moment of every day. Lord, may you guide our hearts so that we may be a people of action reaching for the next generation without equivocation, with every fiber of our being. May we be faith-filled, big-thinking, bet-the-farm risk-takers, never insulting you with safe living or small thinking. May we become living Bibles, proclaiming the glory of you in the actions of our hands and our hearts with every word from our mouth, every thought that we entertain as we share with our neighbors and our co-workers and our friends by the examples of our lives what it is to be a Christian what it is to celebrate hope, what it is to be a people of action. This I pray in the name of your Son, Jesus the Christ. And all God's people said, Amen.